2531, and the first batch of Spartan 3s are about to be deployed. A small battle group containing about a dozen frigates, some logistical ships, around two or three dozen, and the UNSC Spirit of Fire have just been called off from their duties following the story of the original Halo Wars game. By some twist of fate, or some divine intervention, those dozen or so ships are pulled through slip space, and you can use your imagination as to how they end up in 40k. I don't want to throw them through the warp because, you know, demons and stuff, but it, it happens, they got there. Now, I know technically at this point the UNSC doesn't exist, they're going by the UEG, which is the United Earth Government, but I'm going to be calling them the UNSC because that's what more people know them as. So I think the best initial contact possible between the Imperium and the UNSC would be if they had already colonized the vast majority of the solar system that they landed in or popped into, whatever phrasing you want to use. Basically, any situation where the UNSC isn't given two or three generations, they are instantly going to be stomped by one of the galactic superpowers. A million or two million people really isn't that much, especially not in the far future where there is only war. But, and this has to be said, it is much easier to build essentially high industry from the ground up as opposed to having to constantly take down the old technology and build new stuff you get to start at a really good level. Also, last thing before we really get into it, it's worth mentioning that the UNSC at this point does not have access to the energy shielding that they do have in Halo Wars. I know that Red Team has energy shielding, but that's not technically supposed to be true, so we're just going to be running with no energy shielding. Yes, they're still going to have some early generations of Mjolnir, and yes, they're going to have some SPI armor, but it's not going to be anything crazy. No energy shielding. And as for Red Team having energy shields in Halo Wars, give them slack. That was development hell. So I've been staring at this map for the last 30 minutes trying to figure out the safest possible spot for them to set up spot where, you know, there isn't an active WA, there isn't a massive Tyranid High Fleet just ravaging the area, isn't too close to a warp storm, while also avoiding massive Necron Tomb Worlds. Now, let's give them a good start, like this is a Stellaris game, and we're gonna throw them in the very far west Segmentum Pacificus, just north and a little west of Perrin's Gate. Keep in mind, this is galactic, you know, mapping, so the cardinal directions aren't entirely accurate, but whatever. Semantics. I also chose this spot because it's right next to the Halo Stars. Yeah, that's it. I also chose this location because I want the UNSC to come in contact with the Dark Mechanicum well before they come into contact with the Admech or the rest of the Imperium. Yeah, the Dark Mechanicum has, you know, demons and stuff, and uh, machines with tentacles or titties where there shouldn't be them, but, you know, they're also more human than the actual Adeptus Mechanicus. Only within the Dark Mechanicum do they actually give it the old college try of fixing you, treating your ailments and whatnot before just giving you the Jackie Kennedy treatment. The Adeptus Mechanicus will just, hey, if you were standing in the wrong spot, Servitor. It does also have to be said that the UNSC just started fighting a group of religious zealots from their universe, so I don't think they would take too kindly to blood gods or princes of pleasure. I think the UNSC is going to use this to their advantage. Given that the Dark Mechanicum is a lot more, uh, you could say, open to the idea of heresy, all you have to do is show them one picture of Cortana walking around with no shoes on, and suddenly there's a schism within the Dark Mechanicum. Suddenly Vashtor isn't looking so good, and suddenly worshipping the Omnisaya doesn't sound so bad. It also has to be said that Isabella and Dot are going to be seeing some absolutely horrendous things. Uh, they are going to see the absolute lowest, lowest parts of the abyss. They are going to stare into the depths of depravity present within man, and they are going to be disgusted. In our own timeline, in our own, you know, 21st century, we are disgusted by the things people are willing to plant their seeds within. Put that 37,000 years into the future, and they have, you know, 37,000 more years of inventions and species and whatnot to put their seed in. If Isabella or Dot manage to, uh, you know, not go insane from the whole demon slanesh prince of pleasure thing, uh, you know, we're fine. 
but <laughs> it, it has to be said, we're not sure if they're going to survive this. But it's a moot point because they have the tech to make more. Now, on to expansion. Since this is the UNSC after the wars with the insurrection, we can assume that they would focus on expanding properly as opposed to the outer colony situation. Every single rock big enough for a habitat will have people living on it. There will be billions, if not trillions, of habitats within two generations. The population explosion after two or three generations is absolutely exponential. You can be in the quadrillions of people within 60 to 70 years of setting up your first million habitats. Add to that, in each one of those millions or billions of habitats that you have floating around every single corner of your solar system, is going to be essentially filled to the brim with guns. Their equivalent of an orc cloud would essentially just be a bubble of orbital habitats or orbital defense rings. Add to that, you would also have every single moon and every single gas giant colonized. Very, very quickly, either the smart AIs would figure it out, or even the UNSC, through a really, really costly naval engagement, would figure out that the galaxy is super hostile and that they need to just stay in their lane, and develop their technology until they can actually make plays. Very, very quickly they would discover that they have left their galaxy of science and progression for a galaxy of stagnation, grim necessity, and the ever-encroaching darkness. Either we get the Age of Strife 2 electric boogaloo, or we get the UNSC kitted out with some Dark Age of Technology weapons. Keep in mind that this isn't the same humanity locked behind dogma and religious fervor. This is a scientific humanity who can and will find answers to everything. If the raid on the Dark Mechanicum system goes well, and you know, I'm gonna go with it for this situation, I can see a solid percentage of the TAC Acolytes, or whatever the Dark Mechanicus calls them, going with the UNSC. Now, the first generation or two of the, uh, the meshing of the Dark Mechanicum and the UNSC would be very, very interesting, after enough generations, it's not going to be a big deal. To give you a real-world example, three generations ago, we had bathrooms separated by color. So in three generations, seeing the weird snake machine people as people, you know, it's, it's not a stretch. Maybe it'll take more than three, probably like 40, but, you know, eventually. And lastly, before the UNSC comes into contact with the Imperium, I really want a situation where the Thok Dynasty comes into contact with the UNSC. Uh, there is essentially no lore on the Thok Dynasty. They are in the Ferris Manus pile and the Eldar pile where maybe if we run out of good ideas we'll, you know, throw a book on you later. We know that they use radiation weapons, and that's the entire reason I mention them. That's also basically the entirety of the lore on them. They use rad weapons. That's... that's it. Now, to you and me, that sounds like a really, really terrible weapon, but keep in mind that in the Halo universe, cancer is such a normal disease to them that any onboard ship-based medical system is going to be able to treat it. And this works out for the UNSC and the Imperium perfectly. For the UNSC, uh, they have a perfectly treatable disease, so there's essentially no downside to using these super spicy weapons. And for the Imperium, uh, they can decide not to give them all the med treatments, and suddenly you have less mouths to feed. Now, eight minutes in and I finally get to discuss the arms and armament and what this regiment will actually focus on. For those of you who don't know, uh, the UNSC uses 7.62. I'm sure you know that. It's important to mention that because... Essentially, your average grunt on the ground has anti-armor rounds within their AR. Combine that with radiation, which is known to uh, penetrate just about anything that's not lead. We have a regiment that focuses almost entirely on anti-armor or anti-vehicle combat. Now, since everyone's favorite guard regiment, the Cadians, uh, don't really have a planet anymore, there is a vacuum within the Imperium, or the Astra Militarum, where one of the most important systems that produced some of the the best guard regiments is just gone, wiped off the map. This would be the perfect niche for the UNSC to fill. Moving into the logistical side of it, or the stat side of it, uh, the Tanith first and only is said to have around 3,400 soldiers or personnel. This is actually really, really similar to the regimental structure of Australia or really a lot of other First World militaries. The standard battalion or regiment of riflemen, which is usually what the Imperial Guard is, anywhere between 800 and 1200 riflemen or infantrymen, with three support or logistics personnel per rifleman. Now, this doesn't mean that there's three people behind each rifleman just getting him what he needs, but there are three to four people that aren't 
doing the standard rifleman role or standard infantry role. You'd have people whose entire job was vox casting and coordinates for airstrikes. You'd have people whose entire job is medics, people whose entire job is using other forms of weaponry. And this is where I get to introduce a nice curveball, the LAS rifle. Something that a lot of people don't consider when they're factoring the costs of the military is that uh, every single bullet costs something. Every single one. And that is a huge percentage of modern military spending. For example, it's roughly estimated that modern militaries use 300,000 rounds per kill in combat. Yes, this is factoring in training, but each one of those costed roughly anywhere between 15 cents and $3. That is a massive, massive cost. Imagine how much of that cost could be taken away if instead of training on the M8AB or the MA5B or whatever it is, you train them on the LAS rifle, or even better, you have a percentage of your infantry or riflemen be solely dedicated to the use of the LAS rifle. This would save millions, if not billions of dollars in today's money every single day of combat. Keep in mind that using 7.62 rounds, if we multiply that by the 300 thousand round average, we get a cost of $177,000 per kill. And if we can eliminate a, you know, solid 90 to 99% chunk of that cost, then we can use those savings to improve on other aspects of the regiment, say having more Spartans. Now remember at the very beginning when I mentioned Red Team, specifically Jerome, Allison, Douglas, the homies from uh, Halo Wars 1? Now, sadly, Red Team is probably going to be dissolved, considering that there are only three Spartan Twos within the entire galaxy, they are going to exponentially increase in value. More than likely, Red Team is just going to be dissolved, and we are going to get three completely new strike teams. Or maybe we get one new strike team, a headhunter team, who knows how they get divided, but realistically, Red Team is gone. It's also worth mentioning that Douglas, Alice, and Jerome are the last three of the Spartan Twos that probably will ever exist. There's no need to go back to the Spartan Two program now that they have essentially the Astartes program and the Spartan Three program. Another huge benefit to having Red Team there is that they have access to early generations of Mjolnir that they can improve upon. Imagine if Belisarius Call got his hands on some Mjolnir. That is the stuff dreams are made of. Now back to troop numbers. One of the main benefits of having a third of your riflemen be using LAS rifles is that your other two-thirds of your riflemen can conserve their ammo for situations where they need it. You can have one-third of your infantry just essentially laying down never-ending fire, and any time a vehicle or an armored target comes up, your other two-thirds can pop up and use either radiation-based weaponry or armor-piercing rounds to neutralize the threat. And now we get to the fun part, which is the Spartans. Now, this might be a little controversial of a subject, but uh, I am a firm believer that Spartans are essentially just tanks, and they need to be treated as mechanized infantry. They fit this really, really weird niche where they have the hitbox of the person, but they are somehow running the speed of a car and carrying essentially a car's worth of armor. And you can coordinate deep cover strikes using Spartan 3s and SPI armor. They can coordinate with infantry or air support to essentially move through the artillery way smoother than a baseline human could. And this is where we get into combat strategy. Initially, I can see the UNSC opening up with a barrage of LAS fire to convince the enemy that they are essentially just an infantry unit, just another rifleman corps. This would encourage the enemy to use their armor, which is exactly what the UNSC regiment would want in the this moment. Now, Spartans in this very, very early stage of engagement could essentially just sprint around the battlefield, essentially target spotting. It's not the most glorious stuff, but, you know, they're still going to be doing some serious damage. And remember, you are saving millions and millions of dollars per soldier per day by giving a third of your riflemen LAS rifles. This would allow you to have more Spartan 3s on the battlefield at any given time. Add to that, that before the UNSC even came into the 40k universe, they were masters of combined arms warfare. They were thousands of years behind the technology, but the only reason they survived for as long as they did is through sheer strategy. Also, I really don't see any of the Halo vehicles being adopted. Uh, there's really nothing that the UNSC could bring to the Imperium that they don't either have a much, much cheaper solution for, or a much, much better solution for. Now, another option is if the Spartan 3s aren't actually used in the regimental structure, 
at all. I actually see the Spartan 3s being put into a role like the Tempestus Scions, or alternatively, somewhere within the Officio Assassinorum. Now we get to start checking off the temples. Uh, the Calidus Temple, there's really no need. You already have infiltrators. If it ain't broke, don't fix it, essentially. Calexus is also an instant checkoff because uh, there's no psychers, no blanks, nothing like that. It's just you know, boring people. Yeah, I can very easily see Psychers or the Pariah gene being bred into the UNSC humans, but for now, they just don't have it. Although I really do wonder if Psychers would be able to tap into the gene songs or the gayish that are present within the humans. But, uh, food for thought. And lastly, uh, I can almost guarantee that Spartan 3s wouldn't be used for the Eversor Temple, since, again, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And, uh, giving one of those SPI armor just increases the chances of it coming home. And nobody wants that. Alternatively, I can see a whole new branch of the Officio Assassinorum showing up in which it's essentially the headhunter squads that Oni or the UNSC implemented in the Halo timeline. Kind of similar to Noble Team in Halo Reach. Which, honestly, they could fit anywhere between the Vindicare, Adamus, and Vanus temple, but they'd probably have their own branch. This is the Imperium. They like to have everything specific. Now, if there's one thing the Imperium of Man hates, it's wasted manpower. And this is where the Spartan 3 program comes in flawlessly. With the Spartan 3 program somewhere in the Astra Militarum structure, we get essentially a stopgap in between the Special Forces or the Minor Augmented Soldier and the Astarte. For example, anyone who shows up to the Spartan 3 program and they are clearly way too good at their job, you just push them through to the Astartes program. And say you have an aspirant for the Astartes program who is, you know, they're still really, really good, but they're just short of being good enough to be an Astartes. You just make them a Spartan 3, or a Proto-Spartan 3, or something like that. In this timeline, I can very easily see, within, you know, a hundred years of the UNSC showing up in Imperial space, that there is a fourth generation of Spartan that is somewhere in between an Astartes and a Spartan 3. Kind of like an improved Spartan 2 project without, you know, Flash clones and Dr. Halsey. Now, there is one really, really big downside to this that I was putting off, you know, even mentioning, uh, and that is the reduction in the amount of corpse starch being produced. By having more of your aspirant survive, you suddenly have less food to give your people. The Imperium likes to run essentially razor-thin margins, and having even a 2 or a 3% per segmentum drop in the production of corpse starch would mean trillions of people starving. Remember, this is grimdark, not sci-fi. And we are going to end this on, essentially, the meeting between the Imperium and the UNSC. Now, remember those smart AIs that I mentioned previously? Well, they have been working non-stop since they showed up in this galaxy, and they have probably amassed petabytes of data. Just absolutely massive data banks that probably are entire city blocks. With this data, they would essentially have a full understanding of the galaxy and each faction within it. I'm pretty sure within the first hour of them scanning Imperial databases, they would have found out that they don't like AI and that uh, it's really, really bad there. But keep in mind, this isn't just normal AI. This is based off from the neural structure of a human brain. They understand how humans work and thus they would work with humans to convince the other humans that they're humans. I know it's confusing, but it, uh, it'll it work. If Belisarius Call was able to convince Rubber Boot Gorilla Glue that he is definitely not an AI, then any of the smart AI, hell, even a dumb AI, would be able to convince him that they are a person, because it's technically true. I bring up Call specifically because uh, we have almost a perfect example of his Call inferiors, or his minor replicas of himself, whatever you want to call it, lesser versions. Dr. Halsey did the same thing. She has 20 clones of herself. Well, not full clones, but you know, they're AIs ready to be put into a body at any given time. So, same thing. Plus, they could literally just show him the process of someone with a terminal illness being turned into an AI and just tell them that that is how all of their AIs are made. Plus, if you tell Rubber Boot Gorilla Glue that one of his favorite sons, when they are terminally ill instead of going into a dreadnought, can be put into his head and help him form the most perfect supply lines, he would do it in a heartbeat. Theoretically, he can get more done. 
practically, he's getting more done. I think this brings up a cool situation where the UNSC actually has some bargaining power. They are a really, really advanced, they could say lost colony of humanity, and since the Imperium is in such a shit position, Rubber Boot Gorilla Glue is probably just gonna, you know, throw his hands in the air and say, hey, as long as you pay your tithe, I don't care. You guys seem to have this whole military thing figured out. You know, you help me and uh, I won't virus bomb your entire solar system. You know, it seems like a pretty reasonable request. You don't argue with uh, the galactic superpower. I'm not mentioning the Tyranids because they seem to be the extra galactic superpower. Now, we're going to end this off on the biggest problem of the whole video, and that is the Avenging Bean Counter's interaction with the poor, you know, engineer or researcher who's essentially explaining all of their history to Gilliman or his representative. Now, I don't know if you know this, but Chips Dubbo and uh, Master Chief are the two lost Primarchs, so as soon as that poor researcher mentions either of those names, he is going to be turned into just raspberry jam. But yeah, thank you Ouroboros for the help on this one, and uh, thank you for watching. I don't think I've ever asked for uh, anyone to sub at the end of a video, and I'm not gonna do it now. Gotcha.